I'm Peo. I'm a big fan, been a big fan, and this is what I've noticed right away. Because I've seen you, I've been a fan of yours as an actress, and obviously on Grey's Anatomy, and then I've seen you a lot uh, on, on talk shows and stuff like this, and I, and I had a feeling, because I know you're from Boston, but you're sweet spot let me say this like my sweet spot as an actor is like i play whatever everybody has a sweet but you come off very like very sweet very (laughs) but i but like i was like i knew there was a little bit more of an edge to you just in meeting you five minutes before here like you're a boston chick yes abroad is boston bro yeah i gotta be careful it's like that's the first thing i I said boston broad and then you fucking walk out don't worry all right but i'm not that sensitive all right but so i mean so you grew up in Boston. like i don't know boston well now you know uh, i I am one of the public enemy number ones as far as boston sports fans right because you're a new york i'm a new york guy guy there's a big rivalry yes Yes, Uh it's, it's traditional it's like in our blood as far as sports i know you're not a big sports person but you grew up in what part of Boston? I grew up in a town called Everett, which would be like the equivalent of Brooklyn. Okay. Right outside the city. And so I did grow up in a very famous time for sports in Boston. You know, I grew up at the McHale, the Larry Bird, that whole, you know, the 70s super team of right. the Celtics. So I grew up watching that with my dad and my grandparents. And then when I was older, I was a waitress and I used to work in town, and all the guys used to come in. The players, yeah, the players, and then that's cool. And then, and then you get to see who's cool and who's not. Who, who is who is like cool? Larry Bird didn't didn't tip me. Are you fucking mm-hmm. serious? Yeah, was super rude to me, and I was a kid too. You, I, I mean, I was probably barely eighteen. But, but see, I didn't plan on talking about basketball, right. and you said I'm not a sports person. But right. now you're fucking my head up right off the top. <laughs> right. So Larry Bird, when he was Larry Bird in his prime, with the mullet and maybe the mustache, or this might even have been pre mullet. I mean, how long was their dynasty? It had to be. I mean, eighty they, all through the eighties. Right. The 80s okay. So early. I graduated high school in eighty seven. So you know, that's when I would have been working my last year of high school and beyond and larry so, bird didn't tip you yes not a not a nickel listen who knows also we had to keep the restaurant open late for them after it closed because they would come walk over from it it, it wasn't the fleet center that it was the garden then and they would walk over after it was a steakhouse it was called scotch and soda or something it's like right across the street and we used to have to keep the restaurant open late for them and, uh, you know, maybe they lost a game. He was in a mood. Who knows? Not a but- tip. I mean, shit, a tip, like a dollar, 50 cents, you know, like something, not nothing. Yeah, no, I think, you know, he's definitely feeling himself then for sure. That was in his prime, right? That is, even though he didn't tip you, that is cool though, because it was Larry Bird. As opposed to like, so then I had another job at this place, Daisy Buchanan, which is a super famous um, bar on Newbury Street in Boston, and all the Bruins would come in, and they were amazing tippers. They were all good tippers. Yes. So, so the part of Boston, because I'm not, I've literally only been to Boston, in and out my whole life. Um, the part of Boston you came from was a tough neighborhood. For sure, yeah, yeah. Not not the toughest, but um, working I class. Say, it working class for sure. I mean, there's tough, d- different kinds of tough right, neighborhoods. Right. You know what I say? I would say from the outside, it looked like a a very you know, middle class, working class neighborhood. Right. But, you know, mob heavy. Right. Oh, okay. You know, you, you were aware of that. Yeah, not like tough, like the black neighborhoods. Right. Like what are, is it, Mattapan, Brookline? And Dorchester and Roxbury and, and Jamaica Plain and all of those neighborhoods back then. You're not impressed with my black. Mattapan reference right there that I just Yeah, yeah, you? that was a good one. Thank yeah, you. Mattapan was a little far <laughs> out for me. So, I, but... I think that's that was on the red line or is on the red line. I don't know what it looks like today, but so there's different types of of hard neighborhoods I in got Boston. You. you know, there's the Irish, there's the Italian, and then there are the black neighborhoods. Is it is it still like that, or is it all sort of melded together? Is Boston still like because like literally, I don't know. Like, is it still sort of segregated like that? I don't really go back there. Really, to be honest. Um, Why not? I, I, it's just not, you know, I, because I love the weather here in California, you know? Um, all my dreams came true here. So how did you wind up, for a girl from tough part of Boston, wind up playing roles that are always so sweet? Because that's sort of your sweet spot. Like, how Isn't did you- it funny? It's like uh, people see me and they're like, America's sweetheart. Wait a second. She opens her mouth and I don't know. I guess it's like- You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I think- Because like, that's, like, that's what you're good at. You're good at that. I guess it's my physicality. I'm pretty slender. 
I am, you know, I'm a small person. I'm, I'm thin. I'm blonde. I have fair skin. I have green eyes. Right. So I'm, you know, I guess I, my small stature and I, my face, I have like a, a a sweet face, I but guess. But I could see you I playing like a mouth. tough. I could see you playing like. I mean, just talk. I was like, I could see you playing like a like a whole other. I oh, mean, not, I'm dying to like I'm a tough to. fucking Listen, street. You every, know, whatever. Every movie they've made about Boston, the town, Gone Baby Gone. Like every wait, Gone Baby Gone wasn't yeah, Boston. Was, was it? Was Gone? Was Boston? Was it Boston? Yeah, because Ben um, Affleck. It was Boston. Every time they do a movie, you know, uh, I want to play uh, the fighter. I wanted to do that movie so bad. Mm -hmm. um, every time they do a movie, The Departed is like, right. forget it. You know, I could have just completely crushed it because I was so in deep in that whole world. Were you really? Yeah, yeah, kind of. Um, you know, deep to the point where now I realize how deep in I was. At the time, I didn't really have any idea I got how you. bad those guys that I was running around with were. I got you. Because they were so nice to me. You know, I just, you know, did some errands and they gave me bags of money. Are you? So yeah. You, I, I wasn't until after that I sort of realized that like, wow, those guys are some serious guys. But one of my friends ended up dead and and then it sort of dawned on me that it, it was they were probably a little bit more dangerous than I was. And you were unaware. Wink, wink. No, I, I wasn't really aware of like the violence of it because they all dressed so well and were very nice and. You know, and, and you, you know, just like in those movies, you look up to those guys. Right. They took care of everybody. They bought groceries for the old ladies. If anybody bothered you, you know, they took care of them. It, you know, so we just like in the movies, you idolize those guys. Right. Okay. You really did. All right. So you come out to California. No, at first, I didn't know anybody in California. You know, I lost my mother young as a child, and, and I spent a lot of my childhood going back and forth between New York City and Boston. Okay. So I had an aunt and uncle who lived in New York City. Where am I in the city? Um, 777 West End Avenue. Okay. Upper West Side. And uh, my, my Aunt Ellen and Uncle Jimmy. Okay. And my Aunt Ellen is still with us. Um, I used to spend a lot of weekends and summers with them. And, uh, and so I felt familiar with New York City. So I sort of... All my gay friends were moving to Miami, uh -huh. and I knew I could go to Miami, and the weather was nice. Were you thinking I'm going to be an actress at this point? Yeah, I just wasn't sure how you go about that. You know, I was like, I, I knew I had to get out of Boston. Okay. Right? I never liked Boston. I wasn't, um, I, I knew I wanted more. I you got know, you. It's a kind of a negative place. I had a lot of black friends. It's a very racist place. Um, I dealt with a lot of racism right. from both sides. I, that's very controversial when you say you deal with racism from both sides. No, I but, get it. You know, I've I've been you know beat up and spit at from white people and beat up and spit at from black people. Right. Um, so you know, I've I've experienced a lot of uh, of hate from all sides, and um, and so I just I didn't really like Boston so much. I got you. Yeah, I got you. But so when did you say I want to be an actress? What spawned it when you were a teenager and like, you know, in your early 20s, did you love movies and, and what movies and actors and actresses were you like relating to before you were even doing it? Well, I was obsessed with Pfeiffer. You know, I loved Scarface. I loved Grease 2. I loved um, uh, Frankie and Johnny. I Got loved you. all those movies. I was obsessed with Pacino and Pfeiffer together. Got you. Um, so I definitely like she was who I idolized. I got you. And um, I love the old movies too, though. Like um, go, you know, how Betty old? Davis. Okay. And all of those movies. Okay. All about Eve was okay. my favorite movie. My uncle Jimmy showed me all about Eve. That, okay. I think that was the first movie I ever saw. And it, it, it resonated with you. Yes, for sure. For okay. sure. Yeah. And it was super dramatic. You know, I suffered a trauma as a child. So I had all this angst and sadness. And I thought, you know, that's definitely going to be a way for me to work it out. I got you. You know? Um, and, and then how do you wind up in Los Angeles finally um, and start doing it? I, uh, so I was in New York and I was uh, auditioning for things. And, um, Steven Spielberg had sort of been, um, you know, a, a champion of mine. I, really? I, the first job I ever did was a commercial, right? It was a, a L'Oreal hair commercial. Okay. And uh, it aired the first time. And then the next day, my agent called and said, 
I, I happened to be sitting at her desk, and someone from Stephen's office called and said he wants to meet you. Off a of fucking commercial? Yeah, off a hair commercial. That's crazy. I know, I know. And so... Were I, you like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. you think this is a joke? And I was like, well... It was it was very interesting moment for me because I was so afraid always to like, how do you become an actress? How do you start? I can't move to L.A. I can't do this. And like I moved to New York. I got a bartending job because that's what I did. That's what I knew how to do. And, and an agent approached me. I was only working there for like three weeks. An agent approached me. She was like, I'm an agent. Whatever. I was like, yeah, whatever. I thought she was like trying to hit on me or something. Uh-huh. I didn't even know. And then I went and saw her. She was wrote down three addresses. She said, go to these places. And they were auditions. You know, I didn't know really what I was doing. Right. And they were all like three national commercials. And I went to all of them. And she called me back four days later. She was like, listen, kid, I don't know who you are, but you, this is crazy because you have callbacks for all these commercials. And then I went to the callbacks and then she called me back and she was like, kid, you're on fire. You booked all those commercials. That's and- crazy. And I was like, damn, why did I wait so long? Because I was 26 when mm-hmm. this happened, right? Mm-hmm. So I was like, wow. Had I known it was going to be so easy, I should have done this shit when I was 19. Right, right, right. right. But um, Especially with national commercials. Yeah, yeah. So then I was doing commercials, and, and then Steven saw the commercial, and then I said, oh, okay, well, I'm getting some looks. You know, um, this is good. But then I I kicked around, and, and, and some people were like, oh, you should move out to L.A. My agent, actually, at the time who she's not in the business anymore, but she moved out to LA and she was like, you should come with me. And I went out and and I wasn't, I did not fit in out here at all. I didn't look like the other girls. I didn't have fake boobs. I didn't have a tan. I wasn't wearing mini skirts and high heels to auditions. Right. You know, I was like wearing my Adidas and my baggy jeans and no makeup and kind of tomboyish. Right. And she, I would go into auditions, and and she would call me, and she'd be, she'd say, "Did you go?" And I'd say, "Yeah, I went to the audition." And she'd say, "Oh, they don't remember you." I'd say, "Okay," <laughs> they they literally you were like, making no impact. I was making no impression, no impact. I was like auditioning for like Dawson's Creek, right? Okay, and like making no impact. Um, and so then I um, I I came, I went back to New York, and I would get put on tape for things, and then directors would just. And then I got this, A.V. Kaufman, who I'm sure you know, is a big casting director from New York, called me one day and she was like, I heard you're in L.A. I need you to go read for this movie for me. And I said, okay. And I read the sides. And of course, like all actors, I'm like the worst of them. I'm like, this part isn't right for me. I'm not going to be good at this. This is terrible. Why do you think I should do this? She was, you know, Ellen, just shut up and just go, please. Uh So I go and I end up getting the movie. And And which was? Moonlight Mile. Right. Um, and with it, young Jake Gyllenhaal. With young Jake Gyllenhaal, who I had met like two weeks earlier on the street. Uh-huh. I was sitting outside of Jones on 3rd. Uh-huh. And, uh, and he came up to my car and was like, you're so beautiful. And I, That he was, was his pickup line? Yeah, he was. Would he start with you're so beautiful? Well, he it, Like that he would actually, make women I swoon think, now. Like, yeah, young, yeah I mean, no. I think he said like, you're the most beautiful girl I've ever seen or something. That's it was the very fucking smooth. opening line. Yeah, it was very smooth. With but, the eyes and all that with shit. With the eyes, but he wasn't Jake Gyllenhaal. Right, but still. So but I he, had no idea who he was. Right, so it's like beat it asshole and no actually it was like oh my god this sweet kid because like by the way now i'm 30 okay he's right? younger he's younger he's right. like 19 i got and I'm you. 30 right so i said listen i'm gonna tell you two things no uh, number one i'm probably older than you think i am because uh, i looked super young and number two don't be embarrassed because you made my day because i kind of was like you know yeah, yeah, that's cute. You know, I gotta go. But he was just a guy then. He, no, he did shit then. Because yeah, Miracle Mile was, was he was doing Donnie Darko and he was filming all those movies or had just right. wrapped those. He wasn't movies. Jake Gyllenhaal. No way. No one knew and had okay. no idea who he was. Okay, he was definitely adorable. But he's just a smooth motherfucker on yeah, the street. Yeah, and I just knew he was younger, and I sort of you know had to get out of it in a nice way I got because you. I knew he was a lot younger I got and I you. didn't want him to feel bad because I was having a terrible day. I got you. I moved to LA. I had, it was cars. But you I had remembered drive. it. I had nowhere. I had no idea how to get to auditions. Right. Yo, this was before Waze and right. you know, those Thomas guys. Yes, and I know. Tom, Thomas Scott, if you, if you don't know what it is, it was, it was like a, a three inch telephone s- book, telephone <laughs> size book where you could decipher the maps and this is before like navigation. I, I lived off of Thomas Guy too when I came yeah. out here. 
And it would drive you nuts because sometimes you couldn't figure out. But when you did crack the code, it was like, holy shit, I could get from one place to another place. Yeah, if I could just get to that place without being late. I'm surprised you know? Thomas Guide didn't come up with their own app. You're so right. They missed the like, boat on that. They should have been controlling all that shit. Yes. Like, instead of navigation or ways, it should be Thomas Guide. The guy who created Thomas Guide is probably, like, fucking miserable <laughs> somewhere. Yeah, broke me. They took my whole shit. <laughs> You're right. I uh, never thought of that. <laughs> I, 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 Thomas Guide was a motherfucker. Yeah. All right, so go ahead. So you got Miracle Mile. So Moonlight Mile. Moonlight Mile, so sorry. I, that's okay. So I got Moonlight Mile. And then from that... Which is a good little film. A great film. It was based on a true story of Becca Schaefer, a girl who was uh, murdered by a stalker. Um, and uh, it was the director, Brad Silberling's girlfriend at the time, mm. um, it, when she was murdered. And it was his sort of love story uh, to her parents about the relationship mm. that he had with her parents after she had passed mm -hmm. it's loosely based on the events it was it was uh, you know he changed the events but he wrote it and directed it, it was something so dear to his heart oh. um, the movie wasn't as big i think as we all would have hoped it would be but it was critically acclaimed it got talked about it, it did it and this is what little it, movies you know like the i don't know they, they matter more than they did then but like little movies like they would stick out yeah, I think the subject matter, I think for the studio, the subject matter was sad, too right. sad. Right. You know, they didn't know how to market this movie because it was about a girl's death. Right. And the family grieving. Right. So, you know, I think that's, you know, on the business end, I think that's what happened to the movie. But it did its job by the way of everybody noticed me from it. And you started getting, and so what was that like for you when you start getting hot for the first time? Like where you're, you're in a legit movie with Dustin Hoffman, young Jake Gyllenhaal, and, and people are starting to call it, and you're 30 now? Yep. And so yep. what, what was that little experience like? What meetings did you take? What was cool? What was like the most exciting sort of thing from that? Uh, I was like, damn, why didn't I do this sooner? <laughs> Right. I didn't know it was going to be this easy, you know. And from so I started when I was 25. I went to New York when I was 25. So from 25 to 30 is a relatively short time. Right. It took me, you know, five or six years. I did struggle in that time. You know, it's not like I, it was all roses. Every time I would come out to L.A. and nobody would know who I was. Right. Then I would go back to New York and do some commercials and make some money. But um, so so it was I met. Everybody. I mean, I I went into Harvey at the Peninsula. I got sent up in there. I signed to CAA, and oh, shit. Um, yeah, and uh, and you're all, doing general meetings with this one and that one. General and meetings, auditioning yeah, for with this Warren one. Warren Beatty, uh, uh, Harvey, um, Sam Mendes, all of them. You know, JJ uh, Abrams. I met. Um, you know, Sam, Sam Mendes. We we laughed about it later, but Sam Mendes said to me, you know. Don't do television. Right. And I said to him, I met him for that movie Road to Perdition. Yes. And it was a it was a an audition for the role of a waitress. It was oh. like one scene. She had no lines. And I said, you know, Sam, you have the power to change the game for me right now. I can, I look great in a waitress uniform. I've worn one my whole goddamn life. You can't just give me this one I'm not scene. doing an extra scene, motherfucker. I'm not yeah. playing an extra. But I will. I was fine to do it. You know, he was the biggest thing. Jude Law yeah. was the biggest thing at the time. And he was just like, well, you know, if, if I, this sounds like bragging, but if I remember correctly at the time, he said, the scene is about Jude Law. The scene can't be about you. And if I put you in this scene, it was some bullshit he's saying to me. You know, if I put you in the scene, the scene's going to become about you. And the scene has to be about Jude Law. Uh, so I was like, okay, that's a smooth motherfucker right there. <laughs> who's not giving me the job. I said, but still, you still, if I walk out of here saying I just booked the Sam Mendes movie, that's going to change the game for me. And if you're not going to give me a job, how are you going to tell me not to do television? And he said, well, I know it's pilot season. I know they're probably trying to get you to do TV. You just shouldn't do it. And this is 2000? 2001, Two, and 2002. It, and, and, and lo and behold, I mean, the fucking TV zeitgeist changed so crazy it's since so crazy. Then. But it, it actually had to be later than 2002. It had to be more like 2003. It had to be closer to the time when I, when I did the Grey's pilot. Right. It had to be closer to that. But... Anyway, Sam and I have since seen each other, and we've laughed about it, and he owned up to it. He was like, what an asshole I right, was, huh? Right, You know, it, we had a good laugh about it. Um, but, yeah, I, listen, and I give Shonda Rhimes a lot of credit. I, I think Grey's is, is partly responsible for changing the TV game, for Absolutely. Sure. I mean, I think the whole, I mean, the TV game, I mean, I think the, the pinpoint 
is James Gandolfini, The Sopranos, and that's yes. cable, obviously. Yes. And then Shonda on ABC came in, and I mean, you, she's taken it to another level because, you know, the exposure on ABC, it, it, no matter how good Showtime, HBO, and any AMC, all that stuff, ABC is everybody has ABC. Right. And and now it's like. I mean, the, the the movie business, it's like unless you're doing a, a DC Comics movie, uh, even the movies, uh, the smaller movies, it's a weird time because the smaller movies get nominated, but no one sees them. Right. Right. Yeah. Like if you and look there's at- still an incredible bias, right? Like it's, it's not like it's I could though. ever be up for, I, I mean, listen, I, I work, you know, 10 months out of the year and I, and I don't have a lot of free time anyway, but it's, it's not like anyone's checking for me for- Big te- Disney does movies. I work for Disney. Right. I'm one of the biggest money makers Disney has. Right. I don't get offered Disney movies. Well, that's because you're busy, though. No, I'm what? And listen, they don't whatever. See- if they wanted to make it work, I mean, this is right, the bias make it that work. it is. But girls won't talk about that. Actresses won't talk about that. They won't say nobody wants me. Right. I'll say that. I'm okay. Right. I'm okay to say that. But that's you, what it is. When you say nobody wants you for movies, but in this day and age where we are now, 2018, like movies, it's like. If you're working on a TV show and successful, you have kids, like... For sure. Fuck, it's, am it's, I going to do this? Not not because it's not the money, but, like, even creatively, like, the only reason why you'd want to continue working in between your schedule and being a TV actress, let me tell you, motherfuckers, it's not easy. No. It's a lot of time. you got three kids. I don't care if the show's been on 14 years, one year. It's a grind. It's an absolute grind. You have it's to be hard, really... hard, hard work. It'd have to be something yeah. special for you at this point. For sure. And, in, and wouldn't it be money involved? It'd have to be like you really want to do it, right? Right. But I'm saying even, you know, five years ago. Uh, I'm saying even before I had kids or eight years ago before I had kids, you know, there's a real stigma attached to um, to network television actors. That's I true. Think. I agree. You know, I agree. Is. And that's okay. Because listen, you know, everyone's got to eat. You know what I'm saying? And you don't need the whole pie. I don't need the whole pie. Right. I have a slice and I'm good with that. You got a big fucking you know slice. I, mean? I we're got gonna a big get to slice, the, yes. We're, yes. I want to get to that. All right, so Grey's Anatomy. You read this pilot. Shonda Rhimes is in Shonda Rhimes. You, uh, have, you know, you've had success in some films. It's not TV now where, like, TV's the place to be. Sam Mendes is telling you don't do TV. You're probably like, I want to be the next Michelle Pfeiffer and all this stuff. When you got to the part of testing as a, as a younger actor or, or at any point, they have you do network testing. This is like the final sort of. I didn't do that, though. So, so break so that I down. Done, How'd so you I get done Grey's Anatomy? Of, That's my fucking done, long-winded question. <laughs> I had done a couple of. I had done like uh, Eternal Sunshine of a Spotless Mind with Jim Carrey and Michelle Gondry. Uh, Daredevil with Affleck. Yep. I was trying to work old with, school. you know, John Favreau directed that, old school. Which is I a was, classic, which classic. Which is a classic. I was trying to work with dope directors and do great movies. Even if the part was small, I was just trying to be a part of really good projects. But I kept sort of getting cut out. You know, I did Catch Me If You Can with Steven eventually. I ended up doing that with Leo. And... um. And he was super cool and like let me pick the part that I wanted, which was <sighs> really cool. nice. Yeah, I love that guy. He's amazing, that guy. But, but before you um, skip over that, what was, uh, I mean, Leonardo so, DiCaprio is such a star, such of like, he's like the last of a dying breed in terms of. For he, sure. He don't have to do any talk shows. He's Leonardo DiCaprio. What is your takeaway from working with Leonardo DiCaprio? I mean, listen, Leo and I, you know, we have a birthday. He's very close together. His birthday's like the day after mine. I mean, I, I love the dude. I love him. I think he's crazy talented. I'd watch him sit on a sidewalk. Yeah. You know, um, I really am. A, I'm a huge fan. Mm-hmm. And what about Spielberg? What does he like to be directed by? I... Uh, my experience on that, you know, I was so nervous, man. You know, my first day I had to show up and I had to like jump in a bed with Leo. My first day on a Spielberg movie. You know what I mean? My first scene was like in a bed with him. That's so crazy. I was too nervous to even know what was going on. You're just there. Yeah. It's like I was out just of body like, experience. you know, out of body experience, like all my dreams coming true. And, you know, but it was, it wasn't really pain. I was, I was having all these amazing experiences but I wasn't really paying the rent. I wasn't making right. money. Even and on so, something like old school. Even on something like old school. I mean, you know, so, and to me, old school was, I thought at the time, you know, stupid me, you you hear Spielberg, you hear DiCaprio, okay. Todd Phillips wasn't Todd Phillips then. Right, that was his right? first thing. In, in Will Ferrell, it was a different cast. Right. It wasn't Will Ferrell, it wasn't those guys. It was Todd Phillips, but it was three different actors. I can't even remember oh, who it was shit. now. 
And I was like, this is like a guy comedy. Why do they even want me for this? Again, here I go again with like making the worst decisions ever. This isn't going to be good. Why do they want me for this? I'm an actress. I want to be in these big movies with these amazing directors. Who's this Todd Phillips guy? But then I met Todd, and he's so nice and Uh so smart. Uh He's clearly such a genius Uh when you meet him and speak to him. And I really liked him. And so he's the one who convinced me to do it. And it turned out to be one of the best things, you know, I ever did. But how did that script read? Because we all know how the final like did the script not nearly as funny. It's like so. So one thing about that movie, which is Todd's genius, is you know the the dart scene where like he, he gets he gets the dart. Frank the in Tank, a, yeah, Frank the Tank gets darted. That you know they they in editing they put that in slow motion, or maybe actually they filmed it at ninety frames a second or whatever it is when you roll the camera in slow motion. Uh-huh. At that time, I didn't know that that's what they were doing. Uh-huh. You know, and um and so when you see that and it's in slow motion, it's like ah. You know, that that was in my infancy stages. I don't know what the fuck I was doing or what was going on. I was just trying to, you know, not to get in trouble or I, stand in the right spot and say the right line. I you got know? you. Um, I just couldn't kind of believe where I was. Will Farrell was a gentleman, amazing. The day Snoop came to do that song was probably, you know, the highlight of That's my crazy. career. I totally forgot about that. Uh, yeah. Um, I love Snoop. Um, and it's such Snoop, a, a pump pizzle. He calls me. Ha, ha, I see. Ha, ha, I see him at Laker games sometimes. Yeah, I, mean, every, like, every, I see you, pump pizzle. S- S- Snoop is like he's like he should be the ambassador for the United States. Oh, everybody sure. loves Snoop. Yeah, yeah. All right, so Grey's Anatomy. So I'm sorry, to interrupt you because I had no, to double back okay. on those that's two because right. people would be and myself. I would be if I didn't talk about uh, Catch Me If You Can and of course Old School. Just to dip in there for a second. All right, so Grey's Anatomy. Because so, so we're all, then, everybody's one on, no, no, no. We're start with Grace Maddie and like, then you got, you're making 20 fucking million dollars a year. That's the, that's the end right. game. Okay. So what happened was, so I went, so I got a call to go in and meet JJ Abrams. JJ Abrams had done, was doing Alias at the time. He said, I want to bring you on Alias. I want you to play Jennifer Garner's sister. And I was like, you're a genius. This is amazing that I'm sitting here. I really would love to work for you, but I don't want to be Jennifer Garner's sister. Um, you know, did this movie and that movie, and I really want to be a movie. No, star. not about Jennifer Garner. You just didn't want to play this this second. Yeah, I didn't. Well, the truth is, is listen, I had been in Daredevil with Jennifer, right? And the girl's so gorgeous that the whole movie became about her. I mean, no one's even looking at Ben Affleck. Honestly, it's all about <laughs> Jennifer Garner because she's perfect looking. And I got cut out of that movie. Right. So I was like, I, you know, I'm not stupid. This ain't happening you know? again. Right. <laughs> I don't want to play her sister and get, you know. So I was like, I'd love to do my own show. If you want to write me a show, I'd love to do that. That's and cool then, that you had balls to like, I mean, confidence and balls to say that shit at a young... Or, or he, you know, like he said, like, you're crazy. Like, okay, you're saying no to me, but like in a nice way. So, oh, I so he, I was, he was like, what are you going to go do now? I was like, I need, I need money, right? Because I needed money because I kept getting cut out of these movies and whatever. And holding out for good directors wasn't, I wasn't taking any money jobs. So I needed money. So I was going to go to Spain to do this TV movie of the week in Spain with Billy Baldwin. So J.J. Abrams is laughing at me and he said, you are going to pass up this opportunity to work for me. And you're going to go where? You're going to go to Barcelona to do a movie with Billy Baldwin? So a TV movie of the week, no less. And I said, yes, because I'm going to get to live in Barcelona for two months. They're going to give me a bucket of cash. And... um. That's what I want to do. I want to go see Spain. You know, I've never been. So he was like, okay, kid, you're kind of crazy, but go ahead. And, and, uh, and you know, of course, I, actors ma- are notorious for making bad decisions right. on their own behalf. Right. right. We're notorious. Absolutely. So we're our own worst enemies. Can't get out of our own way. So I do this movie and then this stupid movie of the week in, in, in Barcelona. I had a great time with Billy, though. He was a gentleman and we had fun and saw all the sights and ate great food. And I came back. And uh, I get a call that uh, Alex Kurtzman and Bob Orsi, who were writers on Alias, who worked for JJ, were going to write a pilot called Secret Service, and I could go screen test for the lead. Okay. So I was like, dope, okay, this is what I'm feeling, this is it. So I want to go do that, and then my agent calls and says, "There's there's a medical pilot at the network that Lloyd Braun really wants you to do. They don't want you to do the Secret Service show, they want you to do the medical pilot. And I said, I don't want to do a medical show. I want to go do the cool Secret Service show. Let me go do that. 
So they let me, they entertained me and let me go screen test for the Secret Service show. Uh-huh. And then they said, you know, that Glock looks ridiculous in your hands. You're 90 pounds soaking wet. Uh-huh. They want you to do the medical pilot. So I hemmed and hawed and I don't want to do it and do my, my thing that I always do and say no before yes. And then um, finally my agent was like, Ellen, just do the pilot and make some money. These things never go. Stop it. So I was like, okay. So I, I went and did the crazy. pilots of grace. I didn't have to audition. I didn't have to screen test. I didn't have to do anything. I went and met Shonda um, at Barney's uh, Greengrass. And we had lunch, French fries and chicken salad. And I sat and spoke with her and I really liked her. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll do this. I like this lady. And that's, and then. And then we did the pilot. 14 years later. We did the pilot and we were hearing through the whole thing. We're filming the pilot and filming the first. She, we had an order for like 13, right? And, and we were hearing the whole time the studio didn't like the show. They might not air it. They cha- try to change the name at one point to Complications. The next it was day originally set, Grey's Anatomy. It was originally Grey's Anatomy. Then they, they didn't like it so much. They were trying to mess around with the name and change it. And you know, So they, interesting. Like when you look so, back and, at things. And this is, also, this is also my version of it, right? Right. This is also my version. You're sure getting. Shonda has her own version of how it came together. Which is probably way worse, right? I mean, who knows? But I'm saying. In terms of dealing with the network. like the, yeah, the, yeah. The the stress and like it's going, it's not going. Yeah. and. Uh, you know, it's yeah. happening, it's not happening, and you think it's, you didn't even want to do it, essentially. Right. You want yeah. to go shoot guns right. and, and be a Secret Service agent. Yeah. When did the show go from uncertainty to, like, this is a good show? The day after we premiered. We, so, so they gave, well, they, they must have had some promise in the show because they gave us the time slot after Desperate Housewives. And at that time, Desperate Housewives was a smash. Right, they were doing like twenty-five million people. That was back then. You listen to me dating myself, but that was back when TV numbers were twenty-five million. Right, you know, people just, have hits on the air now. They're calling eight million people. It's a hit. It's a smash. Nine million people. We used to do twenty-five million people. I think the Super Bowl episode we did like twenty-six million or something like that. But that that's was crazy. when numbers were huge, and so Desperate Housewives was their breakout hit. They gave us the time slot after Desperate Housewives. So that's when we kind of knew, well, they're giving us a great chance. Mm. Because, you know, your time slot is everything. Mm -hmm. So someone believed in something to give us that time slot. Mm -hmm. And so once we had that time slot, we aired after Desperate. The numbers were huge. And then it was like off to the races. And it just kept going. Well, yeah, we had one day of work left shooting. So we aired on a Sunday night. And then we worked Monday. And that was our last day of season one. So then we had the whole, and then the whole, ep- the whole season, the nine episodes would air, but we were on break. So, I mean, I've had great fortune, but the, the, the kind of television sex, and I'm not even into the money thing, but the, when you, you're going to season three, season four, season eight, nine, ten, all the way to season 14, and you know, like, yo, the show's coming back. How much of a relief, forget the money stuff, because I want to get to that, but how much a relief of the stress of knowing, okay, I'm starting to work in August and I'm going to work eight, nine months out of the year. How much value is in that for you as an actress? Do you know what I'm saying? As, as, and as a person, because so much of what you deal with as an actor, as an actress in this business is the uncertainty. My next job, this is my last job. Is this show going? Fuck, I just did this show. It's great. It got canceled. Oh, I did one season. Oh, we're going to do two seasons. It got canceled. And then, you know, like it, to have that sort of like, this is my fucking job, and it's a dope job. It's successful, and you're gray. You're Margaret fucking gray. Like, for, like how much? Meredith. Just, Mer- Meredith. Sorry. That's okay. How much is that mean to you? Like to have that sort of like certainty, as opposed to ninety nine point nine percent of even the greatest of great actors have so much uncertainty. It's everything because the truth is, is. So I just now started feeling secure, just like now. And for your season fourteen. I, I I always have been like. Justin Chambers and I, who plays Alex Karev, is a you know a really dear friend of mine, and he and I are, are very close. And I always say to him, you know, this is the last year of the show. This is the last year of the show because listen, I mean, I never get comfortable because you know this business, you know this town. You say one wrong thing, you're done. You do one wrong thing, you're done. You do something you didn't even know was wrong, you're done. You say something you didn't even know was wrong and you're done. So 
I've never taken it for granted. I always feel like, oh, they're going to hate us next week. Oh, you know, and, and maybe that's why I'm able to get up and grind the way I do and work the way I do. I, I have a strong work ethic. I've been working since I'm young. I've never taken for granted that, oh, this show will keep going on. Mm. And that must be why I keep doing it. Because I, that part of the acting, it was never good for my personality. What part? Uh, the, the not knowing it's what your terrible. future is. Not knowing this audition, walking into th- this room and being judged by these people. And are they going to like me? Are they not going to like me? Are they going to accept me? Are they not? That's not enough control for me. I don't like that scenario. You know, to like, it's it doesn't make me feel secure. Mm-hmm. So for me, to, for me to be able to feel secure and confident, I like staying right where I know my bread is buttered, mm-hmm. and I don't like going off into the to the unknown and the abyss. And may, you know, maybe people say you don't take enough risks, or I should take more risks, or that's not who would say you, know, you take more risk. I don't know. Who. I don't know. I'm just I'm just you know saying right that you know for me it's like. I've never taken it for granted that the show is coming back. I just now recently feel like, you know, because I know we're probably just going to do two more seasons and that'll be it. Right. But I've always felt like the show can, the ratings can dive at any minute. Look at these TV shows. Right. One minute they're hot, the next minute no one's watching. Ratings can go from 12 million to 5 million overnight. Right. I mean, those ratings on Empire dove. Yes. Dove. Yes. Like, you don't know. You can't take anything it's for true. granted ever. So I try not to. So, I mean, there's been actors come, go in this show. Uh, I mean, there's been so many different, uh, you know, obviously there's guest stars. There's, you know, there's the McDreamy uh, part. You, you know, I mean, there's so many different people that have been on the on the show and for 14 years. When I say great actors that you've stood across, even going into, you know, films, who are the people that, like, have stuck out for you uh, uh, during the 14 years? Like, when you're across from them, like, where you're like, oh, shit, this motherfucker's really good. Well, I got to tell you, the one that's coming to mind most recently is because I just finished wrapping it was I just did an episode with Scott Speedman. Okay. And um, who, you know, hasn't been on a network show in a very long time, mm-hmm. right? He's on that show Animal Kingdom, mm-hmm. um, which he just is is not on that show anymore. Um, but he just finished his, his tour on that show and came to Gray's for one episode. And, and I was like, I had a great time with him. I had a great time with Scott. He was really good, really connected. That's a good actor right there. I mean, another one is Denzel who didn't act with me, but directed me. And I was just like, man, on cloud nine. So what is it? What was that like? I I talk about him all the time as an actor. If somebody say Denzel, describe Denzel Washington as an actor, because I do it all the time. What do you see in him? You know what I love about Denzel? Denzel would say, I never, I never did this to him, but other actors would ask him questions. Why am I doing this? And he would say, yeah, he'd say, you don't know. You don't know why you're doing that. You need to know why you're doing that. What the fuck are you asking me for? You, this is your character. You should know what you're doing. You know, he respects people who are confident and who know what they're doing. And, um, and, and I, I never asked him anything. Um, I would never ask him that question. Never. Right. Right. Nor would I. Um, but that's, I, I, that's he's, cool. he's a super intense man. You talk about people who have a vibration, you know, um, he's got a vibration, your aura, your vibration, whatever you want to call it. There's certain people that have it, right? They just walk in a room and you know, they're in the room. Even if your back is to them, you feel some energy shift in the room. That's a star when the energy shifts in a room and you know, Rihanna has that. Oprah has that. Barack Obama has that. Have you been around Barack Obama? Yep. Leo has it. DiCaprio yes. has it. You know, so it's a. I mean, the the, the general term is charisma. Yeah. Or vibra. It's yeah. just there's just a thing. Yeah. They just have a thing. Yeah. It's a vibe. Yeah. It's a vibe. Yeah. yeah. That's fucking cool. How are you around yeah. Barack Obama? Were you around, did you meet Barack Obama? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the fuck is going yeah. on here, man? <laughs> oh, shit, man. Yo, because of the show. You know, I got to say, Wait, I think I'm the only met- person in Hollywood who didn't meet Barack Obama. There's fucking D fucking C level actors and their right, cousins. Right, right. I was fucking, I didn't ever got invited for eight years. There's been like friends are like, you didn't play basketball with Barack Obama? I go, not one fucking time. <laughs> like, they fucking let you in the fucking White House? 
I didn't go to the White House, though. Where I didn't did go you meet him? I, the first time I ever met him was Oprah had a fundraiser for this new, uh, you know, candidate, Barack Obama. No one had ever heard of him. I had never heard of him. I had never seen him. And the show was already popping. The show was, was popping. And, uh, and we went up to Oprah's estate in Montecito, 40 acres, beautiful place. And I had done Oprah's show a couple times got because you. of my show. And we got invited, and there was this smooth, smooth dude in a suit smoking a cigarette. And I was like, that's the guy? And that was him. And that was, that was the first time I ever met him. And then um, That's cool. Yeah, it was it was really it was really cool. I was like, this is amazing, and I was you know on board right away. Obviously, I think Stevie Wonder performed, and Oprah had like a big, you know, she had a big fundraiser at, uh, up at her place for him, and then and then I met him another time in New York City. Um, it was a very small little cocktail reception with only like ten people, and uh, yeah, that's really cool. You know, I've met because of the show. Right, I've met. I've spoken to Bill Clinton on the phone. And he, uh, on the phone? Yeah. Not in real life? Not in real life. Because uh, I met him, and let me tell you something. Uh-huh. That motherfucker is a charm. I met yes. him, we talked for about <clears throat> two minutes, but I guess soon, like, he was just talking about movies. Like, I was like, oh, shit, Bill. He's like, I liked you and this justified and all that. I was like, I get it. I right. was like, this fucking guy yeah. with his blue eyes and his shit. I was like, yeah, oh, yeah. shit. Yep. But I mean, you talk about vibrations going to the yeah. Denzel and all, but like, you know, there's just certain people. And it's, it's not necessarily the best looking person. It's just a, I don't know, like a coolness or a, a charisma. It's just yeah. charisma. Charisma. It's like Miles Davis wasn't the best trumpeter. But every, if you ask who's the most famous, it's Miles Davis. Because mm -hmm. he just, the way he, his whole thing. His mm -hmm. name's Miles Davis. Right. So going to the Denzel. So uh, aside from that, when he's directing you on the show, like w what else you got for me? Because... That's like my, like, I mean, that's like my oh, guy. Oh, please. And, you know, so Debbie Allen, who's our executive producer, who's very friend, who's good friends with Denzel, she got him to come. And, you know, she didn't want to tell me for, you know, I know she was trying to get him, but she didn't want to tell me. And he was getting ready to direct Fences. And so I think, you know, it was just a good little warm up for him. Mm -hmm. You know, he wasn't doing anything at that particular, mm -hmm. that couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. He was free. And, you know, Debbie Allen can pretty much get anyone to do anything. Mm -hmm. So when she finally dropped the news, I was just like, what? Are you and, kidding me? And he comes on set and he's directing an episode of Grey's Anatomy. Yes. And be honest, I mean, Grey's Anatomy, this is the highest of highest network shows. But the director on a TV show, it's like it's a revolving door. Yes. yes. I mean, obviously, you guys have probably have a family of people that do it. Yes. But like in the early, like I know when I've done television, it's like, oh, who the fuck is directing? And you're like, I've done this 48 episodes. You're not going to be able to tell me. Right. I mean, listen, certain people shouldn't come in and tell us, but certain right. people should. Right. Because, listen, we're on a wheel, right? We're on the hamster wheel, and no one can get into bad habits the way network 24-episode TV actors can get Explain into bad that. habits. Explain right? that. Just because you just – it's like punching a clock. You know, we're doing the same thing every day. We're saying the same kind of dialogue. We're wearing the same clothes. We never step out of our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So we do get bad habits. Mm -hmm. So you do it, – it would be nice if someone would come in and say, hey, listen, you know, stop moving your head so much or mm -hmm. stop throwing your hand around because I noticed that's something you do to emphasize and you mm -hmm. don't need to do that. Um, so – you know, but he, yeah, Denzel came on, you know, we're a locomotive. We're filming 24 episodes, but Debbie was with him the whole way, uh -huh. you know, and the episode was Meredith centric. It was really just me and a couple of other characters. It wasn't everybody in the episode. I, I was beaten up by an epileptic patient, uh -huh. which is a true story that we took from this video we found about a nurse who was attacked okay. by uh, someone having an epileptic seizure. Okay. And uh, so it was based on true events that we had a video of a security video from a hospital. I got you. So we had this and uh, and yeah, that's, you know, one of the, high, the other highlights. I mean, my path has been an interesting one in all the ways I didn't expect it. I got you. You know, I, I wanted to do this and I wanted to do that. But even though I've been on the show for so long and, and, and that wouldn't appear from the outside to be the most creative path. I have an awful lot of my boxes checked. Fuck you know, yeah. I've worked you... with Leo. I've worked with Spielberg. I've worked with Denzel. I don't know why you're so... downplaying it. I mean, no, it's I, fucking you know, awesome. You know, I don't know. I just, you know. I mean, it's I, in the, especially where we are now. It's like you got people, you know, that come out of nowhere. They're fucking like Justin Bieber. Think uh -huh. about Justin Bieber. Okay. He's a fucking kid on YouTube playing. And now he's Justin Bieber. Right. Like, and that's. 
how many years ago? Now you have people like it's YouTube this and musicians this and like you don't even need to like go to a record executive. You could go on Instagram and get it. You could sing in the next thing you know. I mean, actors, I, I encourage young actors like, well, I'm not getting work. I'm like, go on Instagram, do scenes. We'll fucking find you. Yeah. Just the same way they find rappers and musicians. Go on YouTube, do scenes from Shakespeare, do scenes from Goodfellas or whatever the hell you're into. You'll get, if you're good, you, you, there's so many ways to be found. So, I mean, I mean, in, in your career, and then in this article that, like, was a couple, like, about a month ago, that obviously it, it was, it was uh, choreographed in terms of, like, you went out of your way to, like, make a statement about all the stuff with uh, women's empowerment in television. And, and there's, you know, there's been so much talk about gender gap and gender pay. Um, and I remember I, I was texting you, and I, didn't, I hadn't seen the article, and it's like, Oh shit! Ellen Pompeo is making twenty million dollars a year from the show. So forget about the uncertainty. Like, here's a question: Like, you say, oh, what would you do if you got twenty million dollars? <laughs> what the fuck would you do if you get twenty? How did you want? Like, I mean, obviously you've earned it in the show fourteen years, and 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 the show's collectively brought in three billion dollars over three billion. So, yeah. so just talk to me about that. How does that feel in terms of? You know, as a, as a statement for a woman, as a statement for a woman in television, and just as a motherfucker from Boston who was a waitress <laughs> who didn't get a tip from Larry Bird, like all all of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, I just think that. Um, I mean, I don't know, I don't know what to say. I I know a, a, a lot of women have come up to me. I'm very uh, first. I want to say that I'm very grateful for the way the article was perceived. Yeah, because that's what I'm saying. Choreographed asked, in terms of it wasn't you, I, and you should have a hand in it. But still, but still, listen, I I happen to be a, a very authentic person, right? I pride myself on being authentic and telling the truth and speaking my mind because I feel like one of the things that bothers me about society, politics, show business is that everybody's trying to Instagram, everybody's trying to present this image that's better than, mm -hmm. right? Everybody's trying to present what image they want you to see of mm -hmm. them. And my goal is always to try to be as authentic as possible. Mm -hmm. So in my quest for authenticity, listen, I run my mouth, right? right? I say how I feel. And we know that can go sideways real quick, yes. right? So I am grateful that the response. Can it? I don't know. I don't run my mouth at all, Ellen. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm grateful that the response has been as positive as it has been mm -hmm. because I did do it with the best intentions mm -hmm. and tried to do it in a in a humble, truthful way mm -hmm. to inspire other women. But you never know how shit's going to come across. So I want to say first that I'm very grateful to the response that for the response that I've had because everybody has been very inspired by it. And the women coming up to me have really been, it's been a very moving experience. That's cool. To know that you inspire people and that you move people. In the business and just fans, just in yeah, general. Yeah, for sure. Just other women in business. Now, I get into tricky situations because, you know, it's like I, yeah, I had the balls to ask for that money and I had the balls to stand my ground in that way because I had those numbers. Right. Right. I had two things. I had the numbers. CAA, my agency, put together a package for me and told me what the show has made out there in the universe. Was this in your head like I'm not getting paid enough? No, 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 not at all. So, when, you know, when you're doing this this long, right, Shonda had made the move to, to Netflix. And, you know, if she's not going to be at the helm... She, Shonda made she made the deal to for she's doing her own thing in net, uh, Netflix. Yeah, she left her deal at ABC right. and is now going to be in business making television shows for Netflix. Got you. So with Shonda not at the helm anymore, well, you know, it's like, do I still want to be involved in this? And what is the show going to look like without Shonda's involvement? Mm -hmm. Right? How far away was she going to step? Mm -hmm. Because. You know, I'm ride or die for her, mm -hmm. but I don't know about is someone else coming in. Like, what is that? What is this going to look like? Mm -hmm. So we, we Shonda and I spoke and, you know, the show makes a lot of money for a lot of people, her and me, you know, residual wise, everything wise. So, you know, I'm super realistic. I'm 48 years old. I have three kids. I work four minutes from my house. It's a great job. Um... And and so I said, you know, yeah, we want to keep this going. What's it? What do you want? Do you want to keep it going? I mm -hmm. said to her, and she said, yes, I absolutely want to keep it going. And do you want to keep it going? Okay, I want to keep it going. If you want to keep it going, so what do we both need to keep it going? Got you. And I was like, listen, I directed this year. Um, I liked that. 
it did take me away from my kids and it's hard work, but I really haven't done anything in 14 years and I'm getting really itchy and I got some, you know, cool offers from some other um, streaming places. Mm -hmm. Um, I got, I, I had a couple of super cool series thrown at me and I was like, oh, so she's stepping away. This is the time where I could step away. Right. There's a couple people looking at me and this, you know, it might, this might be the time. I got you. But then I said, then she said to myself, you know, what's it going to take? And I was like, well, I need to be empowered. I need to feel like an ownership of this show and I need to grow in business. Ownership in terms of financial? Yes. Financial right. ownership of the right. show. And you don't want to just be an actress. Right, right, right. Which I've had ownership over the show before, but just not as big a piece. I got you. Um, and I think that, yeah, the acting thing was kind of, I outgrew it. You know, I, I told you before I do houses, that's sort of my creative outlet. Mm -hmm. I love home design and mm -hmm. um, construction and all of that but I guess the acting thing was never I don't know I feel like I've done so much of it I guess I that my acting bulb is kind of burnt I got you so I was like but if I can stay here and I can direct and I can produce and I can produce other shows and ABC is going to give me a deal and let me make create other because really I've had a master class in making television right, right? is really I have my master's degree in making one hour drama got I know you. everything about it so, and that's in the business side of it now is what's interesting to me. I got you. You know, acting is cool. Uh, I'm saying I would never want to do it again or I wouldn't want to do it, but it's a young girl's game. You got to get on a plane. You got to travel. You got to live in Canada for eight weeks. You got to roll around in the mud, take your clothes off, you know, walk across a glacier. Mm -hmm. Then you got to put on a dress and parade yourself on a red carpet like a pony and, right. and promote it. Right. It's hard work right. at, at being an actress right. or actor. It's hard. Right. I think it's harder for actresses than it mm -hmm. is for actors. You I know? agree. The conditions, what you're meant to do, the shit you have to put up with. And there, there's an expiration date for, for, expiration for the majority of, of women. It's yeah. That's just the way it is. Especially if you if you started working when you're young. Yeah, You know, sure. like, it's just, just the way it is. So I like the business side of it now. So I was like, this is cool. This is a cool place for me to transition at 48 to transition more into the business side and, you know, produce the show and help produce a spinoff and, and produce other shows. And so I'm more trying to move my business into that now. I got you. And and so what has been the response in just in terms of like when you like see this in print, Ellen Pompeo is making $20 million an episode. And like, what are we buying? Are we buying planes? Are we buying like a car? <laughs> like, like if you're around your friends, are they like, nah, bitch, I'm not paying for lunch. Like, <laughs> well, like, I, well, like, what has been the sort of the fallout from everybody knowing, you know, you make 20 fucking million dollars. I'm not fucking paying for the, for the salad. You could no, pay no, for the I salad. I always have to pay for the salad. That's the fallout. <laughs> I always have to pay <laughs> for the salad. And <laughs> I'm happy to, you know? Right. Um, listen, if you, you know, I, I feel like my whole life, you know, people have been generous with me. This town has been generous with me. Right. People have been generous to me, generous of spirit, the fans to watch the show for this long. You know, the universe has been good to me and I have to be good to the universe back. Right. right. And that's what feels good. And that's the right thing to do. So, um, you know, it's a little awkward to have your pay out there right. like that. That's Typically, not something I'd be because I was going to ask you to do. borrow twenty bucks a day. Yeah, yeah, it's no, like, I'll you know, give you like 40. that's like, okay, fine, yeah. all right, yeah. But but you, you know, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. Like, just in terms of people knowing, like, it's but one you know, thing like what my business manager will tell me is twenty's only ten, Ellen. So slow down. Okay. And flying private will get you broke real quick. Yes. That's yeah, the quickest way. You got to be. Yeah, that's out. not the way to play yeah, it. Do you hear me, DJ Khaled? Right. You hear me, Khaled? Right. Well, okay, I'm sure Khaled's not paying for all those those jet locks. Right. But, right. But that that but flying private is, is that what gets people? Yeah, that'll drain your bank account real quick. Um. So 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 you the, the <laughs> that's house an expensive luxury that you get very used to. Yeah, you got to be really really. It's yeah. got to be some real you gotta guarantee. Be a you got to yeah. So the, the buying and selling houses, you, we were talking about this earlier. This is something you love to do. Mm -hmm. And and how does that work? You'll see, like, like why do you get involved with that? How do you even have time to get involved with that? And, like, take me through, like, your latest house thing. Like, what happens? You I, see I, a shithole? Yeah. You'll yeah. see. You, so always, you, it's always a shithole. It's always a project. I don't think you could use the word shithole now because there's such a stigma on our president just used to shit, but we're saying from a house. Right. It's a shithole. You know what I mean? You gotta, I, you gotta be fucking careful of everything you say. But we're talking right. about a rundown, like you're talking about a place that's, it's, you like to rebuild them. Yes. 
and you see it and like you do this all on your own or you do it with your husband or you have a partner like I do it with my husband who's my partner in everything in life but he's into it also he's into it also yeah he has a great eye he has a great eye for properties and one of his best friends is a realtor so those two scope and they I got find you. cool places and then they'll call me up and they'll say you have to see this place but I walk in onto a property and I either feel a vibe or I don't right away. It's a vibration. I can't explain it. I got you. And when you when you uh, refurbish them and you, you fix them up and all that stuff, do you get how hands on is that? And is that like uh, that doesn't seem like a stress free situation. That seems like it's very stressful. It's very stressful. But, you know, it's exactly like producing. Okay. It's exactly like Are you producing. the foreman and shit? Because, like, are you sort no, of the I mean, contractor? You, you hire people, but the less you're involved, the more money you're going to spend and the more money they can take from you. Because contractors and project managers, you know, they they're, fuck all, around, right? they're all professional extortionists. Right. They know shit that you don't know. Well, how do you know you don't need 7,500 feet of copper piping? Right. Maybe you really only need 50,000 feet of copper piping. You, you know what I mean? They can hustle and extort you for money so easy. And you don't Builders know what's going on. You don't really know what's going on. It's like when you take your car to a mechanic. You don't really know. How, how much you know? do you know about it now? Like how confident are I mean, you about it now? I don't know a lot about building. Like I, I don't know. I know a lot about interior design. I don't know a lot about building. And you could get really jammed up in construction. Do you enjoy doing So you must enjoy doing it. I do. I, you know what I'm I so like? scared of it. You know what I like? I realize this. I like solving problems. I always, you know, people always ask me advice and I said, you always want to go in with a solution. Don't ever go in to a supervisor, your manager, your boss. I just did this thing for InStyle Magazine, this Laura Brown, who I love. She's taken the magazine mm -hmm. in such a positive female empowerment direction. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, what's your advice? And I said, always go in with a solution. Don't ever be the problem. Even if there is a problem, don't go in with the problem. Go in with the solution. I got no you. No such thing as problems, only solutions. That's a Chris Ivory quote. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. And, and you, you said you, so you have a production deal now. Yes. Well, and I, I have had one, but. Yeah, I, I have had one for a few years. Is it something you've been working on a lot or are you focusing on it more now? No, and I've been working on it a lot. Listen, it's it's the hardest thing. I mean, you think other careers are hard. I mean, producing is absolutely the hardest thing I've ever done. Why? Man, because there's so many hurdles to get over. Explain that to what you you so so you have to find even the material, Frau Pompeo, right? the twenty yes. million dollar yes. woman star grazing at Yes, I have to find a book. I have to find a book that's hot. So the book that's hot, there's four movie studios want that book. So I have to now compete with them to get that book. How do I compete with them? I have to have ABC bid for that book for me. Mm -hmm. If they don't bid as high as Sony, if Sony offers more money, that's gone. That's okay. it. Let's say ABC does bid for the book. So you get the book, uh -huh. and then what's the next? Or then you have to find a writer. And it, that's a fucking, that's like getting married. Yes. That's rolling yes. of the dice getting married. Yes, yeah, so you have to find one who likes the book, who has a good take on the book. Then even if you love that writer and that writer's dope, the studio has to like that writer. <laughs> so all those things have to come together, right? And then if the studio likes the writer, he writes the script. They and coach him along the whole time. Hopefully, and when you write the script, you, Ellen Pompeo, and the studio have no power. This fucking guy or this girl, hopefully, don't fuck it up. No, wait, no, no. Did I say how many, no. How many he writes a script, right? This is network TV now. He writes a script. The studio looks at it and says, oh, could you change this, 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 this? He goes, okay, I'll change this, 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 and this. Okay, he changes this, this, this. this. Now can you go back? Oh, oh, we love those changes. Now can you change this, 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 and this? Because we liked it from the first one, but you changed too much. No, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Change, 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 change. Right? He changes all that. Okay, okay. Now we love it. Right? It goes, that, that happens like four times back and forth, right? Where they make changes to his script. Or they make, they request changes from him. Then they send the script to the network. Then the network wants their changes made. So then they say, oh, we love this. This is amazing. It's so good. But could you change this, 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 and this? He says, sure. Even though that's what... The studio wanted changed. We're going to change it now back because the network likes the other way. Change, 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 change. And then they, all these changes, the script looks like something completely different than what he originally wrote.
It's now the studio and the network's version of what they like, right? So, okay, you figured no problem. The script is exactly what they wanted. So now when it comes time for them to make their decisions and tell you what pilots they're actually going to shoot, right, from this, Mm -hmm. what scripts they're going to pick that make the cut to shoot a pilot, oh, we don't like this one. (laughs) And you might not even get out of the gate. What do you mean you don't like it? That's essentially your script. You changed everything about it that he did. It used to be a book. That is your script. You made all those changes. You you wrote all those scenes. Now you don't like it? That's what happens. How do you deal with that? Are you at the point where you'll throw your weight around? And and is your weight weighty enough? No. And, and he, is there anybody? I don't weight? have any shows on the air, do I? I have no weight. I have no weight. And you really, and that's okay. And you really Can't don't have get any weight man. until you get one on the air that's successful. I think it's like acting. I think the first one is everything. You know what I mean? I think I get one, one show on the air. I think the other ones will, once I prove myself, then it'll be easier. Which, by the way, I'm cool to do. Mm-hmm. I'm cool to prove myself. Mm-hmm. But I will sit here and say that I do think it's harder for women. You don't see... Can you name... In, in, in what way? In can what you, way? Can you name any... And I don't want to get too sort of inside the business. I don't know, you know, who who your your fans are that oh, listen millions, to this podcast. Legions, legions. But can you, Michael Rappaport, an actor in this town, knowing what you know, can you name any non-writing female executive producers? It's not many. I mean, it's, is it Shonda Rhimes, right? No, because she's a writer. Right. She oh, can right. write oh, so her non-writing. own non-writing. Pilots. Okay, non-writing. right. So. Got you. Like Mark Gordon, I got right, you. is I got my you. boss. I got you. Mark Gordon's responsible for um, Mark Gordon's responsible for Grey's Anatomy, CSI, Quantico. Mark Gordon's got fifteen shows on the mm. air. He doesn't write a lick. I got you. I understand. He's no. just an EP. Do you think that's women? Do you think it's where we are in terms of like historically women haven't caught up to the Dick Wolves and the Marks? And or do you think there's a roadblock against women for that? And then my other question about that is this because. This is one I'm all for. Uh, 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 all I know is this business. I don't know any other business. This is all I know. And I know one thing. If you and me did a show right now, let's say you left Grey's Anatomy, right? And they did, you know, we did, you know, the Ellen and Michael show. And it's called Ellen and Michael. You being you, just coming off of 14 years kicking ass on a show, and me being me, most likely, you would get paid more than me in the pilot because of your value. And right. wait, but, but one thing that I think has been misconstrued in this, in women in Hollywood and the gender gap is that at the end of the day, if you ain't, the, it's on value. Like Denzel's going to get more than Viola Davis because he's Denzel. Leonardo DiCaprio is going to get more than whoever it is. Jennifer Lawrence is going to get more than me also. Right, but back to Denzel and Viola, I, I you know, to touch on that briefly, I, I don't think that, yes, he's going to get paid more, but Viola won't get the same opportunities, or hopefully now she is getting the same opportunities because I mean, she's, she's so she's, good on how to get away. Yeah, she's not she a, as, is his equal in talent. She yes. is his equal in talent. But it has nothing to do with talent. No, it has nothing to do with talent, but it's it's the studio, it's the studio, the people who hire the studio's perception of what's perceived to, to be valuable, right? Uh, she said herself that she was never seen as a sexual character, mm-hmm. right? That's what she loved about How to Get Away with Murder mm-hmm. is that for the first time, a dark-skinned <clears throat> woman was seen as a sexual creature, yes. right? So I agree with you. It is very hard to quantify what people... The pay equity thing is a challenging... It's a conundrum, right? Because it is... Hard to quantify the value the value of people because yes, people do have a bigger audience. Right, people have a bigger following. Right, you know, and that's so, the value of it. Yes, that's the value. It is challenging to quantify and say pe- some people are should be paid the same, especially with actors because we have fan bases. Right, you know, it's like I mean, some are stars or some are not stars. Like if I'm like, let's say me and Jennifer Lawrence are doing a movie right. and I'm co-starring with yeah. her. And let, let, let's say it's like she's working 60 days, I'm working 60 days. If I go, well, she's fucking, but no, she's Jennifer Lawrence. She's equivalent to Leonardo as far as women. But she's that girl. 
Yes, but of course and, she's gonna get she, more than me. And she's another one. I'd watch her. She's, honestly, she's. I'd, I'd watch I always her correlate watch them paint together. Dry. I, I think they're she's, so similar. Like in term, to me, she's like a, a female Leonardo DiCaprio. She's got the the looks. She's got the charisma. She's got the net. Like she's got an accessibility, but yeah. she's also got this beauty. Yeah. Like I, I, I always correlate them in terms of. But, but sorry, go ahead. That's okay. But th- in the instance of American Hustle, you know that movie right. that was not fair. Okay. Because Jennifer Lawrence was coming off. The wasn't she coming off the first Hunger Games? Yeah. At that time. Yes. So she should have been. Completely on par with those men. Yes. And the flip side to it is that if they undervalue a, a, a female actress, if they say to me, you know, listen, you get to be an American hustle with these guys, right? And we can only pay you this much money. Mm-hmm. If you say, well, listen, if they're getting 20 million and I'm only getting 1 million, <laughs> right. I'm not going to do it. Well, okay, we'll get out, bitch, and we'll just have another girl come Right, in. right. Right, so it, it's going to be a hard thing to have, unless you have transparency, which is going to cause another problem, because then we go back to transparency. Oh, transparency, you mean of what you pay? Yeah, of what you pay I mean, people. what you get? Yeah, it's going to be, well, how do you explain that someone is worth more money than the other person? But as long as as long as long people are willing to, to step up and do the role for less money, right? the studio is like, oh, well, unless every actress in town knows they only offered me a million and they're offering the guys 20 million. Mm-hmm. So all of us should say no. Mm-hmm. So in that respect, transparency would work. Mm-hmm. But if they say, you know... Leo's coming off the Revenant. We're going to give him twenty million. You can't argue with You're, that. You can't argue with that. It's a, it's going to be a challenging, um, a challenging thing to, Cause, to cause overcome. The, the only thing that I was talking just in, in, that I felt like is getting misconstrued in, in Hollywood because I can't talk about gender gaps in anything else because I don't fucking know and I barely know it in my fucking business is like John Turturro. He's my favorite actor. Mm-hmm. He's my guy. Yeah. He's not getting the same amount of money as fucking Leonardo DiCaprio, Christian Bale or any. Those guys are excellent. We're talking about these fluff pretty boy actors. Like if John Turturro does a uh, movie with some fluff pretty boy actor, the fluff pretty boy actor is going to get more than John Turturro. And you're like, well, he's the greatest actor in the world. The fluff pretty boy is going to get the people internationally to come into the movie. He's going to put asses in the seats. And it doesn't matter if it's John Turturro, uh, a woman, or or a guy. And I just think that's one of the things that's, you know, like in this Twitter space that we live in, it's sort of like there's this conspiracy. And I'm like, specifically in Hollywood, value is first. And then in terms of what you were saying, like the Jennifer Lawrence and the... Um, what was the name of the movie we were just talked about with uh, oh, the Bradley? Hunger Games or, or American Hustle? Right. Yeah. Th- then it, you know it's different. So I mean, and you're a rare, um, not just uh, for for an actor, but for an actress to where you like, yo, I have value. You've earned your value for 14 years yes. on a show. But I also have, I also have luck. You know, I, I some people say, you know, I'm not lucky. I'm talented. Well. Yeah, yeah, I deserve all those things because I'm talented and because I work hard, but I think I would be an idiot to sit here and say I am not lucky. Absolutely. I am lucky. Of course. I'm lucky that I wasn't born in South Sudan. You're lucky that the SWAT show didn't get picked up when you were playing the Secret Service. Yeah, exactly. I'm lucky that the Secret Service show didn't get picked up. Um, I'm lucky that I had the opportunity. You know, there could be, back when Grey's, listen, back when Grey's was was being cast or they were making these TV shows, they were not putting women of color in the the leading role mm-hmm. of TV pilots. Mm-hmm. Black girls didn't even have a chance, mm-hmm. didn't even get the opportunity mm-hmm. to be number one on a call sheet mm-hmm. on a primetime network mm-hmm. drama. So for that, I'm lucky. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because just to, to be able to have the opportunities that I've had, um, I feel like I'm super lucky. Mm-hmm. So I think luck you know, does play into it. I know people want to say, oh, luck is bullshit. I work my ass off. Yeah, you do. But luck plays some part in it. It does. I agree. Luck and timing. Yeah. All right. What can I say, Ellen? This is everything that I imagined. (gasps) Really? Fuck yeah. (laughs) And I feel like, this is what I'm going to brag about this. I feel like because of the form of this, and I've seen you on so, I mean, you've done every talk show two, three, four times. Um, but because there's parameters on it, I feel like the essence of Ellen Pompeo has come out on the Iron Rap Stereo podcast. I want to say, Larry Bird, you fucked up. <laughs> 
You fucked up. Okay, now you might see Ellen Pompeo and you might say, I'm a big fan of Grey's Anatomy. And who knows how it's going to, we don't know how it's going to go. I'm not saying that she's not going to be nice. I'm just saying that who knows how it's going to go, correct? Larry who? Larry fucking who? <laughs> thank you for coming and uh, doing the show. This with was me. so fun, Michael. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you.